for short. We're honored to bring um, John Krakauer and Desir Sabir to Adams. As far as I know, uh, this is the first to have Mountaineers of this caliber on our campus. Uh, I'd first like to thank Big I know Director of Student Life and Recreation, and the Student Ahmed, Director of Student Engagement and Success, uh, for their support in bringing these five men here. I'd like to take just a moment to speak about ASAP, uh, because I know many of you don't know about ASAP, or at least don't know what we've been up to recently. A little history, ASAP was started in 1929, uh, debatable second or third oldest outdoor program, uh, outdoor program in the nation. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it was started by Luther Bean, professor of education, who took a few students to the peak of Mount Blanca. Started out Mount here. Uh, apparently they cheated, actually, and they went up to Lake Como by a horseback. If any of you guys have tried to hike that road, you know that I know what I'm talking about. It's cheating. Uh, the adventure program, known in 1929 as the, as the Outdoor Club, has had its highs and lows over the years, but I would argue that our program is as vibrant as it has ever been right now. Currently, the adventure programs consists of a full-service rental shop with up-to-date up Audi gear, climbing wall, and directs activity center, which boasts thousands of user days a year, a new team challenge course with both high and low elements that can challenge new teams and highly effective teams alike. ASAP offers trips and clinics and a staggering variety of human-powered activities from ice climbing to kayaking to mountaineering and even international trips, like you've seen on uh, the slideshow going off here. We're in our second year of the Adventure Leadership Program in Academic Minor, which was built from the ground up based on years of staff training and students' desires. The Outbinder is now the starting point for aspiring ASAP guys. So, we do a lot, but what do we value? Well, we value outdoor environments and believe that spending time in them is good for our mind, body, and spirit. The outdoors is the great equalizer. It does not discriminate between sex, color, nationality, or creed. We value completely difficult tasks, whether they're physically demanding, mentally challenging, or spiritually rejuvenating. In most cases, as many of you know, it's all three. We value education. Thus, we teach skills and ethics on every trip we can use in future applications. We believe that our experiences shape us, and we in turn shape the world around us. So who do we serve? The students first. They're the future leaders of our country and our world. Uh, staff and faculty. Thank you all for coming, uh, for they support our students and the rest of your community, uh, because we understand that a burgeoning leader is only as good as the community that surrounds it. Thank you for coming. A few quick housekeeping items. Uh, please silence your cell phones if you haven't already done so. Really appreciate that. Bathrooms are located outside of the auditorium, uh, on the left and on the right, I believe. Um, we should, we expect to finish about 9.30 with the Q&A session um, to follow. Stay as long as you're able. So now that we have that out of the way, I'd like to introduce the man who first gave me sweaty palms simply from reading a book. <laughs> His travels have taken him around the globe in search of truth, big mountains, and adventure. He is most well known for his engaging writing style that allows the reader to feel as though they are on a climb with him. His books have made, been made into movies, both of which have become iconic to lovers of human-powered adventure. In truth, his name is synonymous with outdoor adventure to the layman. John Krakauer's New York Times best-selling books include Into the Wild, the true story of Christopher McCandless, who finds his way from suburbia to the outback of Alaska when tragedy strikes, and Into Thin Air, an account of the 1996 Mount Everest disaster where 15 people lost their lives. Most recently, his investigative journalism has brought to light certain missteps in Greg Mortensen's Central Asia Institute, which, is, excuse me, which was born from Mr. Mortensen's book, Three Cups of Tea. Without further ado, I'm honored to introduce John Krakauer.
first ascent in Alaska. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of experiential education and climbing and all that stuff. So uh, I, I'm, it's a huge honor for me to be able to introduce Nazir tonight. Uh, I just met him just before the show a couple hours ago or less. Uh, but I've known of him for many, many years. Among climbers, um, he is he is steamed around the world as one of the great climbers in the world. Um, he's probably known to most people primarily for being the first Pakistani to climb Everest. But to climbers, he's known much more for what he did in the amazing ascent of K2 back in 1981. Now, K2 by its easiest route is much, much harder by an order of magnitude than Everest. Among climbers, you know, Everest go home. But K2, some of you that climb K2, you pay attention. And not only did he climb K2, but he didn't do it by the easiest route. He made the first ascent, of, I'm sure he's going to talk about it, so I won't say much, of the West Ridge. Um, he and a Japanese climber reached the summit, and they, it was an epic, you know, it was an amazing climb. They ended up bivouacking. Their summit day, they had dark hit them at, uh, they were still 400 feet below the summit. They had to bivouac without oxygen or food or water or sleeping bags. And, you know, they're lucky to have survived the night, but then they went on and finished the climb. So that was amazing. He, he uh, teamed up with Reinhold Messner, the greatest climber in the world of the last you know, modern era. He and uh, Nazir and, and Messner uh, teamed up for a sense of Geshman II in Pakistan and Broad Peak. Um, he made the first ascent of a beautiful lower mountain called Pine Peak. It was always something I so anyway, he's a, he's a remarkable man, and it's not just his climbing. He, he was born in this remote valley in Charleston Valley. For those of you who have read Greg Wilson's books, you might remember that name. In Hunza, the, the northernmost part of Pakistan, probably the most beautiful, or one of the most beautiful parts of Pakistan, the most peaceful. And interestingly, uh, it's also the, it's the most literate. It has a higher literacy rate in his little corner of Pakistan than the United States. He's, you know, Pakistan has many sects and religions. He happens to be as Ismaili, uh, which he might talk about. Um, he it, he's from what well, used to be the Kingdom of Hunza, and for years, you know, even after it became a modern government, it was still ruled as sort of a fiefdom by the, the, the leading royal family of Hunza. And in the mid '90s, Nazir ran against them. Nobody ever defeated the Hunza. Family, but he won, and for the next five years served in the legislature there. He's an environmentalist, um, uh, a remarkable figure, um, and it, I, I'm it's a great honor to introduce him. I'm looking forward to seeing his show as much as anyone. So come on up. Today I will take you to uh, my childhood, 
deep in the Hunza Valley, where I was born, and share with you my childhood experiences, dreams, and sometimes worries. And then, of course, uh, when you go over through some of the highlights of my uh, experiences, which took me very close to uh, life and death situations where I was able to see death eye to eye. And uh, little, I had a little uh, struggle with my creator, promise to do some things down. Uh, life, if I was, you know, <clears throat> given life, some of which I could build some gap to. And uh, of course, major part of my talk will be, uh, like John mentioned, the climbing of K2. I'd also like to pay my uh, RTS gratitude. For John coming all the way from a long way. It was a, a, quite a dream to see him, but somehow he has not come over to Karakulam yet. I hope in the coming years. Uh, thank you, John, for the wonderful words, for whatever little humble things I have done. I was born in a tiny village right on the border of China and Central Asia uh, in the Hunza Valley. Uh, Hunza is blessed with a lot of natural beauty. And Hunza is the only place on earth from where you are able to see more than 15 mountains above 22,000 feet. 7,000 meters from your car window. There's no other place on earth. If you were to see that many mountains, and very close, like Rakaboshi, which is 25,550 feet, 33rd highest mountain in the world. I took this picture from my house. <laughs> so, <coughs> you can imagine, uh, Hamza is really one of the few blessed places with uh, natural beauty and wealth. And especially uh, when you go across the valley, about 175 kilometer long valley, uh, one of the richest in terms of fruit. Without any exaggeration, Hunza grows some of the best, probably perhaps the best apricots best peaches. We have some 50, more than 50 different varieties of apricots, different tastes, different sizes and colors, and of course cherries, <coughs> but the best are peaches and apples. So all the way from June, or uh, even middle of May, when we have mulberries, again two types, the black and the white types uh, arrive somewhere in the end of May all the way till the end of October. Unza is full of different types of fruit at different times. But if you ask me what is the, the ideal time, the most favorite time of year for me would be to be in Unza from somewhere around exactly this time, from 20th October till 5th of November. We have, as I told you, we have, uh, the whole valley is full of trees, fruit trees, and uh, lots of poplar trees. I saw here also in Alamusa. I'm very happy to see a couple of few things corresponding in nature with Hunza. Uh, some shrubs, and things as I drove with Masood, very similar to Hunza. Uh, I saw a plant which we call Russian leaf. We have exactly the same uh, <coughs> plant. And uh, we have the whole valley is full of this perfume of this uh, tree. It's very beautiful, and sometime in the middle of May, uh, 
we have this this tree blossoming. So that is Runza. I uh, I go back to my childhood and I remember uh, my tiny village of only 25 families uh, was surrounded by rock walls on all four sides. And when we had some strong storms, especially mostly coming from the north, very frightening, quite suffocating also sometimes. And I used to complain to my complain to, to my creator of giving me birth in a tiny place where very little sky up there and all four sides. I remember at nights quite often I used to count stars because uh, the place is at like almost 9,500 feet. Brilliant, clear skies. You could see even the smallest stars very clear. And I also remember between me and my brothers and sisters, uh, five sisters and three brothers, uh, we used to you know, compete counting stars and also sometimes we used to compete counting the satellites that were moving across the sky. We didn't know if, what were these. We thought some stars were just <coughs> moving. We didn't know that those were satellites, spying satellites maybe. <laughs> but anyway, so, but those moving satellites and the stars and also the birds flying across those mountain tops gave me a hope of a world that was hiding behind the, those rocks. And sometimes I used to think maybe if one was able to climb one of those mountain tops, probably we would be able to see places just across the mountain, places that I had heard about like Karachi, America, and even <laughs> London, and all those, uh, even Gilgit and Laval Pindi. I'm talking about six, seven years old. We did not even have a primary school in my village. And you will be amazed to know, like John was saying, uh, Munza today is probably the only place where we have 100% education below the age of 30. Uh, it comes with a lot of stress from the Aga Khan. Aga Khan uh, is the spiritual uh, leader of the Ismaili Muslims. I'm sure many of you have heard. We have 73 sects in Islam. Ismailis are kind of thrown out Muslims. <laughs> to me, the, we are quite strange. Uh, I do not practice religion so much because I keep telling people that my religion starts off the snow line. It may be easier, <laughs> especially in these days. But anyway, Ismailis are very different people. Uh, we do not go to make up our pilgrimage. And uh, we do not say prayers five times, just two times. And you could say a prayer while driving a car. Uh, we don't have to do the physical uh, part of it. Pretty simple. And, and no fasting of all the things. So from other Muslims' perspective, we are not even Muslims. <laughs> we are so different. But anyway, uh, thankfully, the spiritual leader, Aga Khan, is not a mullah. He's one of the most modern spiritual leaders uh, who is emphasizing on education and human development and so many things. Uh, um, foundation is uh, working all across the globe, in the poor areas of course, in, the, in Africa and Asia uh, for education, health and so many other things. And one of the best hospitals in Pakistan we have is the Alham Hospital in Karachi, uh, which is one of the most modern hospitals that we have luckily. And our son was the one who started uh, schools in uh, late 40s. And since then, we even have had American uh, volunteer teachers coming to Hunza in 50s. But unfortunately, the mayor of Hunza used them as tutors for his own children instead of uh, putting them in school. Uh, that way, 
And there was a little kingdom all the way up till 1974, when Prime Minister Bhutto annexed Nunza with the uh, central government in Islamabad, along with so many other tiny kingdoms, Chitral, Swat, uh, a couple of years before Nunza, Nagar, so many small kingdoms. But since then, uh, the representative of this family were the ones who were winning elections all along. And I was pushed in 1994 by youth and uh, some local uh, elders to go in with whatever little I had, uh, fame and all this. I did not spend much time in Hunza because I have been climbing in different parts of Pakistan and Pakistan area. I did not climb in Hunza at all. But somehow, I was known amongst the youth in the dead uh, where they pushed me in and uh, within one week I realized uh, into the campaigning I realized I'm into something wrong. But I, uh, down deep I was hoping that I would lose because I realized that I have got, you know, got into the wrong uh, business. But unfortunately I won the elections. And I got stuck for five years, five long years. And this was Benazir Bhutu's time, our second term. Uh, but unfortunately she was kicked out after two and a half years. So I had to uh, continue with this uh, man. I don't want to name him. Somebody who's close to Mullahs, Nawaz uh, Sharif, for another two and a half years. But I had I knew that I was not going to continue uh, down deep. I decided, and luckily somebody came in who lost elections uh, when, in 94. He came in and I pushed him in, somebody, against the ruling family. We won the elections again. And then I ran away so far away from politics that I stopped on the top of Everest. Because I went to, uh, I went on this uh, Christine Loskov, an American friend and client. She was the president uh, and owner of uh, Mountain Madness. Unfortunately, she died in China a couple of years ago. She was our leader. She invited me as a friend and she was my client in Pakistan. She said, Nazir, don't you want to come on Everest? I was, this was my last three months before my five-year term was ending. I said, that is great, great escapes. I said, yes, right away I signed up. So I went on. Uh, but you know, how once you are in politics, people don't, uh, they just keep pulling your tail. It's very hard to run away. So I had, a, I had to have a very strong reason to run away. So Everest really fit in. And that's why I went and climbed Everest. Uh, but going back to Munza again, I think, uh, let's turn it off. Oh, here. You got it. This is the tiny village I'm taking you back. Uh, we claim at 9,500 feet, we grow wheat and barley and some of the best potatoes. I hear that one of the throws one of the potatoes. Our potato, potato, potatoes, we make uh, seeds down south. Uh, those are used as uh, seeds. So that's the kind of uh, uh, agriculture we have there. These are the kind of crop towers. Maybe, maybe we can just go ahead with one light. Thanks. <coughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Starts. And when I came down to Central Hunza for schooling, uh, we came, my father and I, uh, <coughs> most, of, most part of the trail, four days, we walked along these treacherous uh, trails and sometimes on horseback. I remember we had to cross a glacier, Badura Glacier, on horseback. And uh, 
sometimes I saw with my own eyes one horse with lord, lords of full lord on its back went into a huge glacier lake where in treacherous uh, trail along the glacier there was no other way you had to walk across the glacier Patura glacier for two and a half hours before the Karakum highway was crafted across the chest of Kunza by the Chinese and the Pakistan army engineers. Uh, they started doing this in 58 and finished in 79. But I came down in the early 60s. So we had to cross the glacier. Beautiful, uh, you know, I think barley, uh, we grow there, uh, which we use, not use for beer, but of course we, uh, we eat barley, chapatis. Here we are. As I said, uh, the sun going behind those rocks somewhere, and also the birds and all this gave me the hope of a wonderful world that I see today going across the globe. Places like Alamosa, Colorado is my most favorite <laughs> state. I've been to America more than 15 times, but nothing like Colorado. Uh, <clears throat> the river, stars and the river were my total communication of childhood with the nature and uh, had a very strong impression on, on me, this, the sound of the river. I could not sleep at night just listening to the river that was not too far away from my house. As we see, we came down across the uh, glacier. We had to cross this glacier on horseback. But now, of course, we have the Karakum Highway that connects both Pakistan and China. In the northern part of Hunza, we can use yaks like in Tibet. Uh, no other place in Pakistan, but Hunza is the only place where we use yaks also, apart from the waters for uh, expeditions and trekkers. Uh, we have those uh, wonderful uh, rock towers, unnamed uh, rocks, which are almost 6,500 meters, but most of them are unnamed, uh, unnamed uh, towers. Uh, not too good rock, I think, for climbers. So uh, the climbers never get there. Uh, there are other towers that I'll show you later. These are known as the Popland Rocks. This is the Sandra Luza. I came here and lived with my sister, uh, who was married here. And that's why my father brought me down here to live with her and also to go to school from Aliabad down there to Karimabad here. I used to walk four uh, miles a day, up and down four miles, so eight miles a day. This is the central Runza uh, Valley here in Rakaposhi, as you saw. You drive along and you see Rakaposhi so close to you. And uh, up here is uh, Ultar Peak. Unza goes, uh, as I said, uh, let the card trace in, in full blossom in the first two weeks of April. We get lots of Japanese here for the blossom. Uh, sometimes people call, they say, other European tourists uh, call Unza. You have turned Unza into Hawaii with all these Japanese going all over. So we get a couple of hundreds of Japanese just to see the uh, blossom. This is uh, considered to be about 750 years old. Uh, it was renovated, it was almost falling apart, but renovated uh, about 10, 15 years ago, again by the Ahan Foundation uh, cultural uh, side chapter. Renovated again. That was the oldest house of the Mir of Unza. 
And as, as you can see, we have apricots and uh, cherries, all kinds of colors. And right across from Musa, you see this uh, golden peak, golden pillar, which was climbed by British uh, uh, two climbers, Victor Saunders and Mick Fowler, climbed this uh, central pillar. And from the other side, this is considered to be one of the easiest 7,000 meter peaks. Spendik, also named as Spendik, from here it is Golden Peak. Spendik is 7,070 meters exactly. A lot of climbers uh, climb this mountain for uh, acclimatization for higher ground. This is again uh, a symbol of spring in Hunza, or here, uh, one of the most beautiful uh, memories of childhood. Beautiful uh, voice, sings very beautiful early in the mornings, uh, all along, all the way till the end of summer. I don't know where this bird disappears. This is Ulta, just above. Again, I took this picture from my house, looking north, in Rakaboshi, looking south. You can see, Ulthar was one of the unclimbed mountains, one of the highest unclimbed mountains in Karakun, all the way up till 1996. I attempted Ulthar twice, in, in the company of some Japanese friends, Asagawa, uh, who was one of the best climbers of his times in Japan. He was very well known in the world also for having climbed some of the hardest routes in the Alps. Uh, he solo climbed all the three hard faces. Uh, that's why he got big fame. We have these terraced uh, wheat fields and then you see the poplar trees and this is somewhere in May. Middle of May, the whole of Hunza and the entire valley is all green. This is another picture of uh, Ulthar. I, when we went in 1991, uh, Asagawa and I and seven other guys, uh, colleagues, went up all the way to the uh, ice fields and we went up to about 7,100 meters. Uh, in 1991, but I had to come here to the Alaska and uh, Canadian Rockies actually to work on this skate film. Uh, Hollywood produced a uh, film for laymen, it was okay, but for, from climbing point of view, it was just quite a funny film. So I was here. But the Japanese pushed a long way up, quite close to the summit, but one of the members uh, was ill and they had to come back. I'd like to tell you, Ulthar uh, was a close call, so I'd like to tell you this story. Uh, we, again we went back uh, in 1990, they went up very close, but then I had to go here. In 91 was the second attempt when I went back with the same team. We fixed ropes quite a long way, uh, all the way close to the summit, but uh, it was autumn, November, uh, uh, late uh, September, early October, sorry, not, uh, November, they were there in 1990. So this was October, uh, quite a lot of winds uh, gushing across the bridge, and uh, one of the climbers was Belaine, Asagawa, and me and another climber, he always had a running nose and didn't have enough opportunity to clean his nose as he was belaying. Uh, he got a frostbitten nose. So, you know, we have to bring him down. If we came down for rest, we would be resting for four days. Asagawa loved Japanese Suntory whiskey. We got a lot of whiskey from base camp and we got some wonderful meat, goat meat, and we wanted to rest, so we are resting. Uh, in the tent it was very noisy. It was snoring all night and the next morning I told 
probably you might not sleep. He went to the next tent, just three of them, which was larger. We used it for as a kitchen tent also, mess tent and kitchen tent. So he was sleeping there. I'm alone in my tent and half asleep somewhere around midnight. I heard a very strange uh, calling, very strange uh, voice calling Arif. In Hunza when we did not have phones, cell phones or something new, but even before that, before we had phones, land phones, we used to call people from one village to another from a high point. So that way, about 11, 12 years old, girl or even a boy's voice, quite similar, calling, Arif, it went on the whole, the long pitch. I got out with sleeping bag out of shock and I didn't have the guts to call Asagawa and the police in the next tent who were three meters away. And then, but I just managed to open the zip and look out with my headlamp. Obviously, it was nothing. But I was shivering out of fear. While I was trying to recite whatever little uh, prayers, Quran and all that I remembered, while I was doing that, I heard somebody walking around the other tent with crampons. It did not make any sense because there was no snow and ice on the rocks. Someone crampons clinging and walking around the tent. I thought maybe Hasigawa or somebody was going to, but then there was no sense of putting on crampons. I opened the zip again and put the light out. There was nothing. It went down four times. I was really scared. And obviously I did not even lie down, I just, you know, <coughs> squeezed one corner of the tent and I didn't dare to go and wake them up. I could still hear them snoring, as they were snoring on the other tent. And in the morning, as I didn't sleep, I went to the other tent because we were supposed to go to camp two that day. I went to the next tent and uh, Asgo was having a quarrel with, with the people high up in camp 3. He was having some heavy argument with them and uh, he kept on pushing me to eat more eggs and stuff. And when he started eating, I could see he was throwing things on his shirt like a baby, disturbed baby. Anyway, I had no opportunity because he was not in a good mood to uh, share my experience with him. He did not speak any English anyway, and I had I speak out of no choice. Uh, I speak little Japanese because of climbing with uh, Japanese friends, and also I have a wife in Japan. But anyway, uh, we left after breakfast. We left. Since I did not sleep, I wanted to be the last man. I hate to be in the middle because you have to follow somebody else's pace, especially when you are on the fixed ropes. I was hoping to be the last man, but as Hasegawa left, Hoshino, the young member, went to the toilet area. That meant another 30 minutes waiting out of no choice. I left, so I ended up being in the middle. After about one and a half hours, I stopped because I was sweating. We had a mixed weather. Oshino came up as I was taking pictures and putting on some sun cream. Oshino had a beautiful smile on his face. This young guy smiled and he said, today it's hot, isn't it? I said, yes, go ahead. We had to climb a, about 70 meter rock sled one each time. He climbed up the road and it took about 40 minutes almost. Very steep. And after he climbed, I struggled up the rock face and then high up I saw 
Hastagawa, about 150 meters above me, but there was no sign of Koshino. And then I, within myself, I thought maybe Hastagawa stopped somewhere and Koshino has taken over. Somehow, Hastagawa I saw here, Koshino must have gone into the gully. He looked back at me twice. Meaningful looks as if he was saying, why the hell are you so, so slow today or something. <laughs> and I, within myself, I cursed myself for taking a long rest, too much longer, and I was rushing up the road, fixed ropes, and decided to catch up with them at such and such point in my head. As I was doing this calculation, I heard a big bang as if F-16 passed by, big noise and huge, the whole mountain was shaking. That setup, the hanging setup, part of it came down, hit the big snow slope and you know, whole thing went down, picked them up from the snow face and went down. I was still here, so luckily, uh, but I, out of fear I jumped to the left to realize that I couldn't go anywhere because I was held by the rope. But luckily, the major part of the avalanche was falling down the other gully. I could see different red and black, different things going down with the avalanche. But I think uh, somehow I denied the fact that they were in avalanche. I said, no, 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 this can't be the truth. I denied and for a while I just gave myself a false hope. I rushed up, I said, I hope it comes from their feet, although I had seen things, I rushed up. If they were alive, they would be on the face. From there I saw the rope was broken into two pieces in about within 50 meter distance. Rope going this way and that way. So whatever little hope I had <clears throat> died down and then I said, my God, I was supposed to be in, in the middle, in between. What to do? Going up to came to or I go down? So my mind did not work for a while and then I said, maybe another avalanche comes. Let's get the hell out of here. I, I was carrying about 50, uh, 20 kilograms of food and stuff. I threw things all over the place, got my guts together, back into senses, and I went down. But crawling down that same road that I had climbed up and down about 20 times, I lost the faith after seeing it broken. I was coming down. I was really uh, afraid of the rope. I lost trust in this rope. It was Gabriel rope, one of the best ropes used on ships. I went down very close to the camp where this other guy with the frozen nose, he was there, I called him, no sign of him. And then I whistled, he comes out and he asks me, why are you coming back? I didn't have the guts to tell him the story. I said, I asked him, did you see an avalanche? No, I was listening to BBC. <laughs> and uh, I said, okay, I'll come close to you and then I'll tell you, I told him the story. He then called base camp where Hasegawa's wife was. It was very difficult for me to speak and I requested him to speak to her. She said, okay, let's wait for one hour, maybe they will get to camp two and communicate with us. And I said, for God's sake, you know, just go to such and such place and look through the binoculars. She did that and after 20 minutes she comes back and she said, Azir, Please go down at the bottom about, they went down to about 1,400 meters, nearly 4,000 plus feet. She said, I see two things at the bottom of the avalanche gully. Maybe they are still alive, go. Hurry, it took us six hours to climb down and up the gully again to reach within 50 meters of the bodies. Of course, I was just hoping that we would find them in one piece. We could see them there, and then it was getting dark. Everything was falling there into this funnel, gully, 
rocks and all that stuff, so I decided to go down and just leave them there. Because the wife of Asilo was alone in test camp. She had sent up the cook and the kitchen boy to help us if they were alive. But anyway, one of the Japanese guy with the frozen nose, he says, no, we don't, Japanese don't leave the dead bodies alone. So I would rather sit here. I said, come on. I literally kicked him and took him down. Then the uh, Hasirawa's wife met us across the glacier. I had to meet such a brave lady. Uh, she asked me the whole story and then after uh, she left and went to her tent and in the morning I saw her swollen eyes but not a single tear in front of me. But then she requested me to ask for strong people from Hunza. And after two days, everyone from high up came down, got together, and then she said, bury them like the Hunza way. Boxes, wooden boxes, facing them towards Uthar Summit, from where you could see Uthar Summit. So this was the uh, close call. I was just lucky, only 10 minutes away from death. I deceived death. <clears throat> and right across Umtar is Diran, 7,257 meters high. Diran is again very special mountain for me, uh, where my elder brother died in an ice avalanche. I have, uh, he was in Marine, he was a Marine, and uh, this Marine expedition went up and uh, they were buried by a huge ice fall uh, just here in this uh, a huge ice fall broke and then on the left side of the shadow they were buried in 1980 and next year 1981 I had all, already invitation by this Japanese so I was ready to go to K2 but it was a very difficult thing to do because uh, you know in Hunza Anywhere else is the same, but in Umza we live uh, as a more closely knitted family. And if you lose your elder brother, it's absolutely impossible. He was inspired from my climbing. He, although he was five years elder, but he started climbing uh, five years after I started climbing, but always in the army. And, but I had to go to K2, no choice. Uh, after losing brother, we went uh, searching for the bodies, three people, including my brother, on a helicopter, and then we climbed up. But a uh, huge ice fall, I had buried him. I, I had to tell my mother, I'm just going to base camp, and, but uh, when we climbed, it, uh, it made a little news on the radio. Uh, so she did not trust me, and I didn't have to tell lies since then. Uh, to open my way. Of course, I feel guilty for their suffering all along. Uh, well, again, we see this rock tower, uh, Lady Finger, we call it. Again, from your car, from the road. Uh, wonderful rock. A Japanese couple climbed the front, uh, one of the hard roofs uh, on the face. The French <coughs> climbed the easier route from the coal in 79 and the Japanese climbed 10 years later. I was very popular with the uh, rock climber. We dry and records uh, in sun and the uh, people keep chewing. Now they are selling, they have become more commercial. Uh, but they used to consume the dry food in winters, but now Hunza is exporting these records to different parts of Europe. Rakaposhi again, and as I told you, the entire valley is on fire. Late October, the poplars go much yellower. This is middle of October, I think. In Hunza, we had a very strange natural phenomenon. In 2010, uh, 4th January, huge landslide 
somebody who just happened to be there took this picture and blocked the entire of the river. As you can see, uh, about uh, 480 feet high debris coming down from the right side, blocking the river for about seven months before it overflow. The whole half of that village, the whole thing went down. I took this picture uh, from a helicopter while we were flying over the debris. It went on coming down for a couple of weeks and uh, you saw that this one. The lake is now 24 uh, kilometers long. Uh, lake, all these villages came under water, they are under water. There is about nearly uh, 40 feet water higher than where it is now. Uh, this picture was taken at the very early stages. Uh, so we have 24 kilometer long lake, three and a half villages underwent, went uh, submerged under the water, 19 people died. And now the link between China and Pakistan is uh, no more there. We use boats. The only way is to cross this uh, uh, lake by boats. Again, autumn colors. You see, the Unza water was not as clear. This is a picture after the lake. Uh, you see the, one of the old forts there. From Unza, I'll just take you to Nanga Parvat. Uh, we see Nanga Parvat northwest from Karakrum Highway. As we drive uh, along the Indus, this is the Indus somewhere in autumn. It go, goes ten times smaller. Indus, as you know, many of you know, flows all the way from Tibet and Plato all the way down to Arabian Sea, down Tibet, across Kashmir and the whole of Pakistan. Lifeline of Pakistan, we call it. And uh, when you drive from Islamabad, you drive along Indus, these beautiful color, colorful trucks. As you fly, I took this picture from there. This is Nanga Parvat, the ninth highest mountain in the world, also known as the Killer Mountain because Germans, Hitler, after they climbed the northwest of Iger, sent Germans to challenge Nanga Parvat in the 30s, 34, uh, 39, especially 37, 39, uh, almost 25. Uh, Germans and Sherpas were killed by avalanches and that's why Nanga Parvat got this reputation of killer mountain. This is in the Amir face of Nanga Parvat and uh, this is the other side, just opposite side, Rukal Wall. I attended Nanga Parvat three times but I have never been lucky, uh, never climbed. But in 1983, when we went up this Hanshad route, they call it, just under the cloud, up the ridge, uh, we went to 7,500 meters uh, up this ridge, all the way 
to the cloud and above, Camp 2 and all the way to the ridge skyline, we fixed Camp 5 and uh, because of bad weather we came down. Another strange experience, uh, I and one Japanese climber, it was our turn to fix ropes between Camp 2 and Camp 3. We fixed ropes and came down and we were sleeping in Camp 1. Shimura and I, Shimura slept quite early, but I was still awake and I heard very strange uh, noise from the other tent. I could not stand it for too long and I had to wake him up. It was like somebody dying on deathbed. Uh, strange noise. We didn't dare to go and check the tent, but anyway, I woke him up and then I said, Do you hear something? He said yes, and pretty soon he fell asleep again. I couldn't sleep, no way. All night I didn't sleep, but next day we came down. And after almost 10 days, another people were fixing the ropes higher up. After 10 days we were going for the summit attempt. And just above this uh, little cloud, I'm sorry my pointer didn't work. Above that cloud, uh, on that big snow face, we had our Camp 3. Seven Japanese and I started from uh, Camp 3 at exactly 6,800 meters. Shimura, who and I experienced this strange noise, he told me in the morning, I said, I am not well. He had an argument with the leader. He said, I am going down. I said, okay. We left. But we were coming up after like one week. We had big snow, burying the ropes, wind blown snow and new snow. So it was almost chest deep snow. We were just going through, through up the face. We were pushed by time, the Japanese were running out of time, so we were hurrying and it was a stupid decision later on we uh, realized. But we were just digging the ropes out of the snow and uh, I remember Dr. Arai and I were talking just on the top of this uh, rope, it was just where we fixed the ropes. We were talking and then I heard a big, big boom and then I'm falling down, head down, face on to the snow. First, for a few seconds, I didn't even know maybe what was going on. Then I realized I'm in an avalanche. I'm heading, you know, the whole avalanche was probably sucking even the air out of your stomach. And the snow was trying to force down my throat. The hardest thing was to keep breathing and keep the snow out of the throat. While it's quite amazing to see how we fight for life. I was trying to dig my arms into the flowing river of maybe almost one meter a deep river of snow under me and just flowing down and trying to dig my arms into it and the whole film of my past was running through my head very quickly at the same time I was touching my parents, friends and everything but at the same time I was fighting with my creator I said no I'm not ready to die. This is not fair. I should have been given enough notice. I should, you know, I have to marry, I have to do this, and I have to write. All the wish list I presented. I cursed myself for not doing this, for not doing that in time. And then, uh, so all this struggle was going on. But then I knew that I will just go over the edge and I'll be in the air, fly before I touch the ground. Some probably 1500 meters at the bottom. So I am just going through <coughs> all this dilemma, fighting with God. I said, no, no, this is not, this is not fair. You know, I have so many things to do. But somehow, I said, what the hell, one has to die, so let it be now. If, if, if it is, now I am ready, but the only wish 
out of all the wish list i only left on my list was to know what was happening to my colleagues it was such a strong wish i said i really want to know here what is happening to them that was the only wish i said okay i'm ready and then while i was doing this i went kind of for a fraction of a second i went into the air and i thought okay i'm over this kind of my soul flew out of my out of me but then i hit the face again and then later on i realized there was a big border in the middle of the face so i went over the border and then back on the face so i'm going 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 getting ready giving up but there was tiny hope still and trying to breathe and you know trying to move move around and slowly i i realized that i slowed down and slowed and slowed and then i stopped didn't stop quite completely i was very slow and then i was moving out of fear then i heard doctor arai behind me saying this is don't move we are falling again and then i froze where i where ever i was and then in a while they came and picked me up i just checked my body i thought i was in pieces but thankfully i was in one piece i uh, sprained my ankle left ankle and then i looked up the face i saw japanese all over the face everybody calling shimura shimura was the only person when i was talking to arai dr arai i saw him at the bottom and he was still about 100 meters below the fixed ropes the big momentum of avalanche took him down the edge we never found him if i had gone i could have dragged everybody with me because we were falling in rope the whole big face broke of course we had dead men and all kind of stuff it was some rock pitons with seven people's weight and you know momentum of the avalanche dragged everything out so we were falling with the fixed ropes if one went down the edge he could easily pull everybody but thankfully uh, just stopped 20 meters above the final edge uh, doctor arrived with a broken arm gave first aid to the leader he had a deep cut i could see his intestines but the deep cut by the rope it was so um, fast and sharp everything was kind of uh, burnt up and frozen no bleeding and two people had broken arms we just but four people later on at base camp they were laughing they said we had a wonderful ride we were falling upside down you know but those four guys can help everybody and we came down so this was the second close call shimura never found uh, we all looked for him here <clears throat> as we try to start to uh, try your imagination hair nose neck breast tummy and feet known as sleeping beauty <laughs> if you make out along this uh, skyline beautiful <laughs> i didn't give this name <laughs> is one of the pakistan airlines pilots who flew up and down uh, they gave this name this is sleeping beauty uh on along the namakarta bridge we see this on the flight to skardu we fly 40 minutes flight takes us to skardu as i told you we have to to climb k2 and all the big big mountains either we fly to skardu 
or drive along the Karakulam Highway in about 24, 26 hours sometimes, two days. This is Kardu, beautiful rocks, some of my early young days rock climbing practices in the Indus, very quietly sneaking down all the way. Uh, Skardu is at uh, about exactly the same height, 7,200 feet, uh, just like Brother Musa. You see wildlife, uh, quite a few things, especially uh, when Josai uh, Plateau, when near Skardu, is very famous for brown bear. <laughs> we have some wonderful rock carvings uh, very near Skardu, only 20 minutes drive uh, dating back <coughs> over 1500 years. Now I know the secret. I was doing it wrong. <laughs> From Skardu we drive like in eight hours to the last village. Many of you, I'm sure, Masood has been there. <coughs> uh, we take this uh, rough road drive all the way to the school in the last village to climb K2. Now I'm, we are heading to K2. On the way we come across this uh, beautiful old fort, Shikar fort, which has been converted into a four-star hotel, or some people think it is a five-star facility. Uh, there are a couple of others, old forts, uh, converted into hotels by al Khan Culture Services, and uh, a lot of diplomats from Islamabad go there. <coughs> we drive along the entire Shikar Valley, and after eight hours, we reached Ascoli, the last settlement, at about 10,000 feet. The grove, you can see a couple of fruit trees and uh, lots of uh, potato there. So somehow, I think the altitude is very good for potatoes. I just came across some women carrying firewood. These are the, uh, the plants that they are carrying. I was referring to earlier on this one uh, right here while driving. This is the team uh, that I was on in 1981. Uh, our team leader, Matsura, who was the first Japanese to have climbed Everest. And uh, some members are not in the picture. Uh, Yamashita, that's myself there. Uh, 13 Japanese and myself from Waseda University to Kong K2 to West Ridge. These porters carry about 25 kilograms on their back. The government regulations uh, do not allow more than 25 kilograms and some of their personal belongings comes up to about 30 kilograms. But I was amazed to see in Nepal a young boy, 18 year old boy was carrying on his back when I went to Everest, and even some women carry 60 kilograms on their back uh, with just sleepers. <clears throat> uh, this is an old wine bridge, a bruzi, and all those climbers all the way up till 1988 crossed this wine bridge. The locals used to fix it on a very ferocious river, the Marno River, but it is no more there. We have a little better uh, footbridge fixed for the truck trackers and climbers. As we walk up, we come across some rocky <coughs> trail trackers coming back as we go up. This is Paiu. Bayou was the biggest kicking in my climbing career. 
why it was attempted uh, first time by American team, including some very famous names, uh, early pioneers of the Himalayan climb and American uh, great climbers. Uh, but unfortunately, they did not succeed. One Pakistani uh, climber died in Avalanche in 1974. And then in 75, again, uh, another French team did not make it. In 1976, uh, when after college, I had little bits of climbing exposure here and there with the Japanese team. Uh, then I read an advertisement in a newspaper asking for applications uh, by an army expedition. They were going to this mountain and uh,
we had a big field up there, snow field just behind this rock. He was lying in the sun and uh, uh, encouraging me to lead across this uh, summit ridge, very tricky uh, snow and ice mixed ridge, three pitches from the cave. And I took a fall just before uh, getting on to the summit. It was quite a steep, almost an overhang, the last uh, almost one and a half meters. I fell down about 50 feet, but luckily uh, Manzoor helped me. We were using uh, safety rope, and then I put my guts together and got, got onto the summit. I was lucky to be the first, and Alan was watching me all the way. Uh, he did not want to get the summit. He, he wanted this to be a Pakistani mountain, so Alan and, um, was just <coughs> clapping and asking us to hurry down and then we came down. So Bayou was the first stepping stone in whatever little climbing career I did. We go up, as we go up, this is the snout of Baltoro, which is 62 kilometers long glacier, sometimes about 6 kilometers wide. And you see these wonderful rock towers. Uh, we go across the glacier, and for almost six days, you walk on a glacier. To get, that's why K2 becomes more complicated than Everest, because to go to Everest, you don't even walk. Only for half an hour, you are on a glacier, or maybe one hour before the best can. But here, you have to walk with borders and everything. You have to walk for six days on the glacier, up and down. And besides that, Everest, best can, if you run fast, you can just, within one hour, you can be at a lodge where you can have a bear, beer, and everything. But this is real, total wilderness that makes uh, it's, uh, Karakum much harder, uh, especially in Balboro area. K2 is peeping out from behind these uh, beautiful rock towers, uh, Trango group. Uh, we call this Balboro Cathedral. Lobsang meet there, uh, some wonderful fauna, and uh, we do see some uh, Markor and uh, also Ibex mountain goats. This Trango uh, necklace tower is very popular. I took this picture from one of the air safaris, first time climbed by Joe Brown and his team in 1975. This uh, Urdukas is the camp. This would be the last green page before we come back after months if we were to climb a big mountain. Very historic place. And as we go up, we see Payu there and the uh, Trangos, the Ulibia Tower, which was again first climbed by uh, Bill Forrest, Rankau, Kim Schmidt, the team. America. All these wonderful rock towers have been climbed from different routes by Western climbers, and a lot, lot of American rock climbers have been uh, doing some fine, very fine routes. As we go up the Baltoro Glacier, very smooth uh, and very safe glacier. Rob Sangspire was climbed by a great child, very famous uh, climber from here and uh, Doug Scott in 1985. All these are unclimbed, about 6,000 plus towers because we have these big giants. Uh, Mashabrum, North Face. Mashabrum is also known as K1, Karakul, Survey City, Serial Number 1, was considered to be one of the, the highest mountain in Karakul for many years before uh, the British explorers discovered K2 being the highest there. As we go up, we see these helicopter machines buzzing up and down because many of you may have heard about the Siachen conflict, Siachen glacier uh, problem between India and Pakistan. Lots of army up there, so we see these helicopters going up and down, but 
somehow the positive side is that these things make a mountaineering rescue much easier. That's the plus point. A uh, close up of Mashburu North Face. Uh, this route was climbed by Japanese in 1989 and an Austrian team just uh, jewelling up their ropes. But this is probably something for the next generation. Very challenging uh, North Face. As we go up the Baltora, as you can see, beautiful. So you, if you are lucky, you can come across on some movies. Uh, beautiful rocks, beautiful colorful rocks underneath, beautiful ground. You know, every minute the scenery changes. Mustak uh, Tower there, French and British, went the fast ascent. Uh, somehow, is not attracting too many climbers in the same times because it's pretty hard and not that high. Uh, but we reached Cambodia here, K2, at there in Broad Peak. Uh, we came across <coughs> an international, some Americans, French, that's my son, and a lot of other youths uh, were taken up by my own an adventure and famous climber. Came there from Cambodia and brought me, we see, this is the normal route known as the Bruce Zirich, uh, where Americans attempted to. In Pakistan, we call K2 American Mountain for, uh, for all these many attempts. Uh, Americans went on, took it as a challenge, while the British were hanging on Everest. And in the end, the New Zealander climbed on the expedition. But anyway, unfortunately, I keep telling the Italians that they stole away the summit glory from Americans who almost made it in 1953, very close to the summit, where uh, they had one member uh, with high altitude sickness and they put him down. A very famous story where uh, you know, one climber did a self-arrest and saved the lives of five, I think. Others were falling all the way to the bottom if he did not arrest them. Uh, with one eye sex, he stopped them. And because of that, they were not able to complete the summit. Next, just the very next year, the Italians uh, came and I'm sure they used a lot of uh, hardware, pitons and stuff, sometimes ropes. And used within a year. Next year they just uh, climbed two people. So the first time in 1909 it was attempted by Italians and then Americans from 34 all the way up to 53, several expeditions, finally Italians completing this route. And I went on this route in 1977. But I was not lucky. Looking down from the summit, I took this picture from Broad Peak. We came up Balboro, Cambodia. British gave this name, I think. Cambodia is a place in Swiss Alps, a place where many glaciers meet. And uh, that's why I think the similarity. They gave this to Cambodia here. We go into K2 here, go to the Gashi rooms here, and see each other further. <coughs> In the east, because of four here, the 62 kilometer, kilometer long glacier. This is the Bruzi close up, and this is our route, <coughs> West Bridge, part of West Face. We were not able to finish, it was too steep, and we ran out of fixed, fixed ropes. That's why uh, we traversed the magic line. Messner, Reinhold Messner gave this name, uh, name to this bridge, magic line. We spoiled two loops by doing that because we were not able to continue up the chimney on the West Bridge. Just to take you on the uh, Bruzi again, uh, as many of you know, from the shoulder up here is the bottleneck uh, right here. 
here is where a lot of people, over 20 people were killed just here. This is, I call it death throat, people call it bottleneck and what not. But in, when I was on the Japanese-Pakistan expedition in 1977, one year after I was lucky on the bayou, uh, I and four Japanese out of 42 members were selected for the first summit team. We had our highest camp somewhere there, 8,110 meters. The, out of the whole expedition, I think about six nights we spent here. We spent a night and other members spent a night and a couple of others. But we did not see anything coming down. But now the whole thing falls down and killed 11 people in 2008 by uh, ice avalanches from this era. Uh, just amazing, maybe global warming, or I don't know. We did not see a tiny little piece coming down in 77 when we spent a night just here. You can't even imagine. But the Americans uh, in 1953, they were very close. I mean, some of them tried to climb here. Uh, another route quite high there, but somehow uh, they were not lucky to get the summit. So uh, I would like to just briefly mention the story of 77. Myself and four Japanese uh, at camp. Around midnight we heard uh, snow falling on the tent, and then uh, about 1.30 we left, and somewhere there, the blizzard, strong blizzard, was just blowing into our faces when our leader was a kind of a, you know, harakiri type Japanese climber. He said, bad luck, we are going down. We came down and then uh, we were told at Camp 5 to go all the way back down to Camp 3. Oops. Uh, we went down to Camp 3 here, all the way from there to Camp 3. Camp 4 was here, Camp 5 was right here on the shoulder. They said you have no place, no tents, no food, so you, you get punished to come all the way down here. Next day, three Japanese who were in Camp 5 went to Camp 6 and next day they got good weather, got the summit, and one Pakistani and another three Japanese were here, they went up and then also climbed. Our leader, Baba Guji, who was a kind of a samurai, Japanese, he said, let's go. We, we around midnight left and all went all the way to Camp 6 in one day to try our luck. But unfortunately, as we reached Camp, uh, camp 6, Ashraf, the first Pakistani who climbed, and another, another Japanese who was kind of crazy because his oxygen uh, bottle finished on the summit. He was talking about green fields and all kinds of stuff in camp 6. He walked in with a lot of snow on him and uh, with crampons into the tent. Just imagine uh, his state of mind. He walked into the tent with crampons. We tried to stop him but he walked in. And two people were missing between camp 6 and camp 4. And our people were told to go and look for them. So Baba Uchi and another two guys went down looking for them. I and Watanabe were asked to stay and look after Hiroshima who was not well. We tried to serve him some soup and tea and stuff. And in the morning, I and Watanabe were hoping that these guys will come back and we will try the summit. But another two people came and they said, this is the end of the expedition. The leader called out the expedition after putting seven people on the summit, so we went down to camp five, we spent the night, and in the morning as I was putting on boots, I heard people like crying. I opened the zip and I saw, you know, my colleagues who were not lucky, they were crying. I went out and involuntarily I joined. And I don't remember ever since my childhood, I cried so much. Uh, we went on for almost one hour when we, uh, I think, we ran out of strength and stopped crying. 
the only two people who were not crying were this Japanese guy who was a little strange and the cameraman who was so busy just taking the shots of these crying people and you know he was too busy and came to us as if just there laughing at us wonderful weather and we are going back and uh, we all hugged and uh, promised to climb K2 together again but it never happened unfortunately when I went back in 1981 all four of them had died on different mountains Baba Vichy died on a mountain Vesha uh, Group 5 and there on the summit he fell into a crevice and Teranishi died in China and uh, Watanabe was crushed by a snow uh, ski machine, snow machine in Japan and uh, Ube died on uh, Everest. So when I went in 81, I was the only one who was carrying this promise on my shoulders for uh, climbing not only for myself but for them. And uh, definitely it was deep in my soul and all the time in my head. So we established our base camp at 5,300 meters, about 17,000 feet. Our west ridge route goes up like this, camp one somewhere there, camp two, camp three. This was the highest point where Doug Scott and his team uh, arrived. They got to this and we found a couple of pitons and things. But in 1978, Chris Bonington led the uh, cream of Briti British climbers. They went across this face and a huge ice uh, snow avalanche brought Nick down and he, they never found his body. Doug was just lucky to survive. He was also in the avalanche, but uh, they abandoned the expedition from there. 1978, 1980, Doug led a minute. Peter Boardman, Joe Tascar, and the another top British climbers. And uh, the next year then we went up. Not much luck. I think ours, uh, they were not lucky, but we were probably carrying more luck in our rucksacks than them, but much less experience. In our Japanese expedition, we had one guy who had climbed a 6,000 meter peak, the leader who climbed Everest, but he was all the time at best camp. And all the other guys had a lot of training in the Japanese Alps in winter, but they, they did not have any high altitude experience. I was the only one who had been to 8,000 meters on the other side of K2. So we went up fixing ropes, typical Japanese traditional style climbing. Every inch we fixed ropes all the way up to the top of this field here, snow field, M4. And then camp 5 at 8050 meters. The most dangerous part was a chimney here, about 180 meter uh, tall uh, avalanche belly. And uh, from here, then of course the leader decides for the summit team. So I was lucky to be part of the summit team. But I remember while I was leading a pitch here, my toes went very cold and my uh, boots were probably not that good. Uh, the Japanese brought my climbing kit. I had tears in my eyes at the end of the day and uh, Bani said, what happened? I said, I have cold feet and I don't think paper is for me. And he told uh, the leader at base camp, Matsura had better boots than I had. He said, okay, I will send my boots up the Z can come down and try. So I had to come down. And this was out of uh, my 28 year climbing experience, some of the best moments in my life. Uh, what happened was, as I was going down to try the boots late in the evening, uh, somewhere in the middle of this field, as I was coming down on the fixed ropes late evening, I saw. Uh, full moon coming from behind between the, uh, the coal between Chowaliza and uh, Broad Peak. Just coming out from far below me for the first time. And uh, I just stopped. I love moon anyway, but when you have full moon on K2, you 
can't ask for anything else. I stopped there and it was kind of a meditating uh, situation. I went deep uh, into some thinking spree. I could hear the tiny rocks falling and the crackling ice far beneath at the bottom of the mountain. Snow, little snow falling on the faces and little breeze just blowing and making this, this beautiful music. And then full moon. And that was the time when I felt uh, a real acceptable tiny piece of nature. And I felt this exactly the same thing when I saw <coughs> the dead body of uh, Scott Fisher, a very close climb, a friend and one of the brilliant climbers, uh, who I met only once. We have been in communication for many years. But one day he wrote me a letter from Road Peak Base Camp. He said, as if we have been writing, knowing each other, it feels like as if we know each other for the case. But bloody hell, we never met, so let's meet. So I went all the way from Kunza to Skarni to meet him. And in 20 minutes, he got committed, he got me committed for Everest. I never wanted to climb Everest after I climbed Cape. Somehow, I don't know. I never had the interest. But Scott Fisher taught me into climbing and committing for Everest in 96, 95, uh, August 95. And I was supposed to go on his 96 expedition. But when I went to Japan to pick my wife and my kids, she was there uh, to attend her ailing father who died. I was coming back with them to Islamabad. This was in January 96. I told my wife, although the plan was almost there for almost six months, but I never talked to her. Here I come up with this news. She says, okay, if you're going to Everest, we might as well stay another year here instead of going and worrying for you in Islamabad. I said, Daddy, had no way. This was one, but the other reason was I was in politics in Hamza and there was some problem around Muharram, we call when the Shia uh, Muslims beat themselves with chains and knives and this is a uh, spiritual ritual for them. But somehow we had a big trouble around those days. So I may, somewhere in the beginning of May, I will be crawling up somewhere on Everest while my political opponents will tease me. There was big tension between these two Ismaili and Shias in Hunza for the first time in the history of Hunza because. My political opponents did not find any other excuse, but they were using religion to take revenge from, my, from me. So I thought about it, and then I decided, no, I don't think I can uh, afford to go. I'm not justified to be on Everest. I wrote up uh, facts and sent it to Japan. He never answered me back. And I was hoping to one day explain my situation to him. But the only opportunity that I had was uh, in the shape of a few tears when I came across his dead body about 25 meters away from the rope that we were climbing. Uh, soon after that, I knew where he was. He was buried. <clears throat> I'm sure many of you have read. John's book, which talks so much about the whole thing, unfortunate accident. And uh, the Sherpa pointed it to me on the way down from the south summit. We went down from the south pole to the south summit. We ran out of ropes and the snow was very bad across the summit ridge, so we did not go that day, came down. So on the way down, the Sherpa showed me uh, Scott Fisher's. And that's where I did my explanation to him for my tears. But the next day, not day, actually, after this tragedy, actually, people climbed up at night, 
about 10 o'clock at night, we leave the last camp so that we get to the summit in time and get back to the camp safely. That has been the practice since uh, this tragedy in 96. We left the next day. Most of people went down, but I said, no, I, I can't go. This is the third attempt. And I failed on Everest from the Tibetan side in 97. And this time, this was my third attempt. And I said, I can't afford to go down and come up again. So I stayed on. And I was using oxygen, a lot of oxygen actually, because I wanted to fly my best because after the failure of 97, a lot of journalists asked me, aren't you ashamed of coming back alive without the summit? So that way, uh, Everest had become a challenge for Pakistani climbers and also for myself. So I was using oxygen. Next day I'm going up again and I saw full moon coming up from between uh, Makalu and Lhotse from this cave. Amazing full moon coming from far below you for the first time. I just couldn't breathe. It was so wonderful. I stopped and then my Canadian colleague Ben says, Aziz, you are coughing too much. Uh, maybe you are tired. Why don't you go back? I said, shut up. <laughs> you only worry about the summit. You don't know what what drama is going on around you? Just keep quiet. So I kept, you know, uh, telling him all the way to the summit. Wonderful. I was happy for Scott Fisher and all other climbers who are dead there. Uh, if somebody who is into climbing so extremely, probably, I think their souls are just hanging around up there happily. What else? I even think that same way about my brother. Uh, so that's how I felt uh, some spiritual experience right there as I was dragging my body up the final slopes of Everest, watching the moon playing hide and seek behind the Lhotse summit ridge, you know, it has cracks. Sometimes we needed headlamps. Some, when the moon was out, we didn't need it. So we went on and on. And as we were uh, reaching the final, West Summit on Everest, uh, I could see the moon then slowly disappearing behind the western horizon and handing us over to the sun rays as the wonderful uh, warmth of sun, sun rays touched the highest part of Everest. So those two moments in my life, one on K2 and one on Everest, probably were the most, the richest moments and I felt, okay, maybe my coming to this world probably was just meant to observe these two moments. And I was a happy man. I would just easily and happily die. Uh, of course, that kind of feeling that nature was accepting you uh, living or a dead Scottish did not look outward up there at 8,500 meters and I don't think any other part of nature, waters, do not accept you that way. So it was very fitting to see him there peacefully, another Sherpa nearby. Uh, I don't know why I went to Everest just to share this uh, wonderful moment on K2 with you. This is a cloud just placed it in here. This is from my Everest trip actually. A beautiful cloud. I just wanted to share the picture with you. <clears throat> we go along this, other than the British were uh, going on the snow fest, but we kept along the rock and snow line to be safe. And uh, that's Angel's Peak, that our can do at 6,400 meters. Uh, I took this picture, picture from the uh, air safari. So this looks much steeper from this. But anyway, this is the route that we went up, up the chimney here. Could not do this, so we traversed the magic line there. This, uh, the hardest route so far climbed by Russians 
in 2008, I think, yeah, 2008. This is the Chinese side of K2, as you know. K2 makes the boundary line between China and Pakistan, so does Everest between Nepal and Tibet. Chogoliza is also known as Bright Peak. Gives you company all the time, whether you climb Broad Peak, Gashap Dunes, or K2, Chogoliza is just there. One of the finest mountains climbed by Armin Gull, very famous climber from Austria, who died, who was the first to climb Nangapar, the killer mountain, and he died on Chogoliza uh, in 1857. Yes. Uh, looking down at our base camp, glacial lakes, we use these lakes for water, uh, looking water. <coughs> this is the spot where I had this experience. Suraj's boots fit me and I'm just preparing to go up again uh, in camp 3. Looking east, Chogliza there again in Cambodia, right here, and the Gashabun peaks and the Siachen mountains far away. Another uh, picture from the air of the route. Doug Scott and his team uh, got up here. And we went up here. This was the dangerous gully. Came five here, climbed up the chimney, and from here we came back. And then next day here, and then back again. And then third day, I of Anini Amashta went this way up. This climbing around 8,200 meters. We see uh, Rakaposhi and Hunza Mountains about 85 to 90 miles away. Yamaishtha and Rosani, we left, just left uh, above the chimney here and the base came down there, looking down. And uh, again, base camps over there, looking at Rakakoshi and other mountains. Yamashita is following me while Lani is resting just across the snow bend, traversing to the magic line. As we see Brahma Glacier and some Chinese mountains here, and the Hoza Karakum in the back. I took this picture from there. So we climbed up here. We tried here, but fixed ropes, we ran out of fixed ropes and it was very steep actually. We went across here and then this is the upper end of Udruzirish here. We climbed this one. <coughs> Concordia in the back. This is at the end of the traverse at 8,300 meters on the uh, magic line. Chogulis are there and Broad Peak in the back. Now looking from Broad Peak, looking on K2, this is the bottleneck there, the shoulder, and then uh, the death throat. And so this is our route. Traverse here and then we spent a snow cave here, just above this rock, at 8,510 meters. It was not planned. Another picture from the air, from here, so you can see the West Summit and the main summit there, and then the Abruzzi Ridge, the Russian group there, and uh, <coughs> it was pretty mixed from this end of the traverse, mixed climb, rock and snow, no ice. As I finished this pitch, I was swimming myself and Mutlani for almost one hour 
without being able to take one step out of this sugar-like snow field. And then it was getting dark. We had no choice but to dig a snow hole. Of course, it was just, we were all tired. It went very slow, like, you know, the, the, our Isaacs would go rest there and then drag some snow out. Three hours. It took us three hours to prepare a snow hole for three of us to sit like chickens there. But uh, somehow, Otani was trying to save on the batteries. He did not talk to base camp. He just told them that we are spending a night in a snow cave. And uh, we settled in. And after a while, I felt my toes were going cold. And I thought, I'm losing my toes. And I tried to uh, untie. You know, in those days, in 81, we, were, we had uh, these nylon straps uh, with our crampons and uh, untying those uh, frozen nylon straps. It took me a while and a lot of effort to do that. While moving around, I broke, I hit the wall of the cave and there was no cave. I broke out of the cave. And of course, the Japanese cursed me. Thankfully, I didn't understand much of this then, so it didn't really matter. <laughs> but I could see they hated me. And I, I was carrying a big rucksack, so we put our feet in there, and just uh, somehow I uh, took off my boots and put on the tent shoes, feather boots, and uh, uh, we were just struggling, lost in our own worlds. I think this was the longest night in our lives, but. In between, Yamashita was falling asleep, so we had to kick him and keep him awake because, you know, the blood circulation goes slower and when you sleep, then you probably you don't wake up forever. So this was what I and Otani were doing and somehow, I don't know from where, Otani managed to bring a tiny candle and he was trying to warm up with this candle. I still remember, I think he was in the best spirits. Otani was trying to sing sometimes. And I even saw him handing us a little tiny tube of honey. We consumed our uh, lunch around 12.30 when we got here, and there was nothing. We were idiots, we underestimated the route. We thought we would climb in daytime and come down. That's why we did not carry anything, all our water bottles and everything. We were carrying oxygen bottles, two each, my son was using oxygen all the way up to here, but I was not using it. Otani was also not using it. They forced me to carry these two bottles. I said, no, I don't want to use oxygen. They said, okay, if you don't carry two bottles, then you just go down and can fight. I had an argument and I was no, I had no choice but to carry 16 kilograms, 8 kilograms each uh, French oxygen bottles, I remember. We dumped them here. And uh, Yamashita also used up till here, and then it's, it is much worse if you are using oxygen for a while and then stop it. Maybe that's why he was not well. Uh, and then, of course, we dumped oxygen bottles and things that we didn't need and whatever hurried all the way. Most of these pitches uh, I led and Otani just few, but uh, Yamashita was not leading and he was just following us on the road. And from here, the night was never ending. It was going on and on, darker and darker. And we were lost in our own worlds. And uh, probably this was the longest night. And uh, I was really craving for light. The light was not coming that easy. And uh, we did not talk. I remember I was just praying and trying to keep myself away from this cave wherever I could go into my childhood, youth, here and there. But anyway, somehow, I will never forget, thanks to the broken wall, we could see east also. We were facing southwest, but I was on the left, so I could see, I was looking all the time into the east. And I will never forget this wonderful sign of life, about a thousand miles away in the east, probably somewhere on top of Everest. I could see a tiny sign of light coming and then catching up 
growing bigger and bigger and bigger and then finally these sun rays hit the upper part of K2. Otani was too greedy, he went out to catch up some warmth from the sun rays, but very soon he came back, he said it's colder out there because there was a breeze with the sun. I don't know, somehow with the sun rays we have a breeze. He came back, then I found my boots were full of snow. Not only snow, I'm sure there was some sweat, so this, this, they were frozen, full of snow. My God, I was trying to uh, clean boots and I was really devastated to see that because I put the boots between cushioning my, between my body and the snow face. Uh, I was stupid and careless and uh, while I was clean, cleaning the boots, this was the first time I smelled. There is a big difference between the Asians and uh, the Western people, especially Americans. They would never do that, I think. My Japanese colleague said, Okay, Nazir, you seem to be too slow. You wait here, we will climb and come back. Don't move from here. And do you know what I said, Dandi? <laughs> you know, I just, the adrenaline, adrenaline, the force, the spiritual force from within, the anger and all that, got me a new strength from within and I just, I don't know how I managed to clean my boots and I said, okay, they left me, they went out. But I caught up with them somewhere there. They had gone only 20 meters. I caught up and thankfully that snow, the, the sugar like snow was harder and with their steps in the morning, so I, I easily caught up. They could not believe seeing me there and then uh, I just took over because Yamashita was breathing very hard and he was very slow. I went over and uh, took over the lead from Otani and then uh, another, final lead then Otani took over and he got to the West Summit. As I got up, Otani says, Nazir, we have to go back. Are you joking? No. The leader at base camp is worried that if we are not able to get back to the camp tonight, we will die. So he's asking me to just take you back. I said, no way. I'm, I will die, but I'm not good. I did not know that they were recording at base camp, so I went into a fight with the leader at base camp for 45 minutes, translating and all that. The Lezan officer comes on the radio and he says, Nazir, if you die, I kill you. <laughs> I didn't know what he meant. He meant later on, we found out that he was trying to speak Japanese to English. That if we allowed you to go, and if you die, it will be our responsibility. This is what he was trying to say, but it was so funny. You know, uh, I didn't know that they were recording. I did a lot of cursing. Uh, Later on, I was you know, sweating when I heard at base camp, but then they played it in uh, Japan on the uh, documentary. Uh, they romanticized it more than what I said. But anyway, here, 45 minutes dialogue, what a waste of time. In Indian, I threw the transceiver to Otani. I said, you want to come? I have to climb for the guys, you know, not only for myself. I no way I'm going. So he said, no, no, please wait. And then he tells the base camp that Nazir is not agreeing to go back. And then Yamashita was not well. He got up, he struggled up here, and he said, he begged the leader at base camp to allow me and Otani. And he said, I will rest here on the West Summit. And only then the leader agreed. You know, these typical Japanese leaders, like their war, uh, they act like general in the war front. But anyway, he asked me, how long do you think it will take? I said, maybe about one hour. It's quite easy going. Just going to the Chinese side will be easier on the region then. Okay, even if you are one meter below the summit after one hour, you will return. Promise? Yes, okay. We go. And uh, from there, uh, I took over. Again, I got some new strength after this uh, cursing. Best camp, we went across 
and then 12 meters below the summit I stopped and uh, you can see a master there on the west summit and Otani <coughs> I mean this you see these wonderful volcanic rocks <coughs> near summit and uh, I stopped here and I told Otani to get the summit glory first because I was a guest climber on their expedition anyway. He says, no, 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 keep, keep on going. And then he had the guts to say, no, get to Israel and you go first. I said, no, come. And we held uh, hands and we climbed the last 12 steps to the summit hand in hand. And we, as we went up to the summit and we, my Olympus poem one self climber this picture of Ani there and uh, that's not a very good picture but anyway Ani took this one and uh, looking down the north side as he was very emotional and talking to best him most of the time crying I took some pictures uh, of the Chinese side of K2 K2 glacier there uh, the weather was not too good on the other side because next year my friends from Japan were attempting, they climbed actually in 82, the first time they went to the center of the north side of A2. So I was taking pictures and then I, this is the, uh, the north side of A2. I took this from the plane again, K2 from the north side and the Russian route. Our route is just behind the ridge, Angel P, Broad P, uh, North, Central and the Man. 4, 3, 2, and 1, which is also known as Hidden B, and uh, Concordia there, and the Siachen Glacier Mountains. Quite amazingly, this is the wall between K2, between Pakistan and China, all these 8,000 meter peaks, and just next is a huge drop. These are not hardly 6,000 meters from 8 big drop not any big mountains, there's a big drop there. Uh, so, took the pictures looking down here and then praying for the souls of those four colleagues and all the people who died due to glacier on the north side there. So K2, uh, like John very kindly mentioned, of course, <laughs> Everest is Everest. I cannot believe when I climbed Everest as the first Pakistani, out of no choice, I was, you know, pushed by these journalists. So I went to climb Everest and I was received by 10,000 people in Islamabad. They tore my shirt away, you know, throwing me into the air. <laughs> It was such a big drama, but when we climbed K2, there was tiny news in one of these English newspapers when we climbed the news from K2. So that is how ignorance, uh, especially in the journalistic community in Pakistan, when they told me, aren't you ashamed of coming back alive without the summit? Although nine people died while we were on Everest in 97, and I was lucky to bring my 10 people one piece. So uh, that was K2 which will always remain as one of the finest and luckiest uh, memories and expeditions. I was in Japan and all those climbers are still alive. One has gone missing, disappeared. He just disappeared somewhere uh, because he had a little brother had huge loans. One of the members from this expedition but uh, 13 of us met, we talked about it, and one Japanese for the first time said, Zee, we salute you if you did not fight with the leader from the West Summit. I always, in my life, K2 is the highest point, but if we did not climb, it, it will never be. So I salute you for your uh, stubbornness and fighting and uh, your efforts from K2. It was very nice. I mean, he was speaking Japanese, uh, 
now, by now I understand quite a bit of Japanese. This was last uh, April. We met and had a lunch together and they promised to come to Hunza <coughs> next summer. So K2 uh, stands on top, but uh, I call it American Mountain. And uh, as I said again earlier on, uh, Alan Slick is uh, my mentor, one of the finest people, and he literally kicked me when I made this mistake, and thanks to his uh, <clears throat> yelling at me, uh, I am still alive and uh, able to come and share this few experiences with you. Uh, last year again, I, once again, I would like to thank the uh, Adams State University Adventure um, <coughs> outfit for making this possible to me. Some wonderful people like you here, uh, fulfilling my dream of seeing the world across those uh, rocky walls in my village. Uh, that has been a wonderful life. And whatever I little I am today, it is all because of contents today, otherwise, thankfully I didn't finish the university, otherwise I may end up as a clerk or some teacher or somebody, but uh, <clears throat> I think the mountains have given me so much I could never even imagine. Uh, it has been a spiritual uh, journey each time I went into, into the mountains because I don't think Mecca as any smiley, I don't go there, but anyway, no mosque or any prayer place gives me that much close connection to my Creator than mountains. Because as we human beings, probably, when we perform under the shadow of death, probably then we connect with our Creator quite more often than uh, usually in, in cities and elsewhere. And that way, each time I go to the mountain, that is a journey, it's kind of a very special uh, pilgrimage into nature. Uh, because today I think on God's earth, mountains are the only, the purest places they will always be, besides being the source of water, I think they have a lot to give to humanity. And as uh, a custodian of mountains coming from Hunza, uh, I now value the people, the lives of people who have been living in those harsh areas like here, some of these areas here. Uh, I think uh, the people in the big cities and elsewhere owe a lot to these people who are just living in this nature. You are also blessed people. Beautiful. As I said at the beginning, Colorado is my most favorite uh, place, state in America. You have a wonderful country, amazing country. Even the plane gets, you see how tired, it gets tired at the end of the uh, long flights from one end to the other. But coming from a small village, coming to this world, and meeting some wonderful people, most climbers are a bit crazier than normal people, otherwise you would never go there, but quite spiritual and uh, very addicted to the extreme beauties of the Creator on this earth. And uh, because of a lot of beating in the hands of the forces of nature, each time we learn our own weaknesses, we humble much more each time we come back to the mountain. And that's why I think one of the secrets of going back, although I lost about 58 closest friends, including my brother, those who I shared things for months, what takes me back is the spiritual link. And I think those strings that these mountains hold on to, they literally capture your soul. And once you interact with mountains, uh, they deeply, then it's very hard to go away. But for any person just standing in front of a wonderful mountain, they have a lot to give. 
in terms of spiritual strength, the belief that one can have in eternity of this God's great uh, creature and uh, this one of our, uh, we each time get some spiritual strength. I would like to thank you all again for finding time from your wonderful and busy lives. And once again, John, I would like to pay my gratitude for coming from such a long way. It's a great honor for me to meet you first time. I have read your books, and we have so many common friends. And thank you, Masul Bhai, and uh, thank you, Adams State University, for having me here and sharing this evening with me. Thank you very much again. Thank you again for coming.